Hello, welcome to Boxing Day 2019. Oh god, it's taking been a long time coming. Anyway, hope you're all having a lovely Christmas. And so I thought, as a little bit of an end of the academic advent calendar, I would have H. Miss Edinburgh pop up. And I'd do a video for her as well, because she has one of those careers which is, frankly, massive. Often overlooked due to her more famous younger sister having survived World War II and being put on display in London. Okay, this is the other sister of HMS Belfast. They are of course both town class cruisers, which as you know, are one of my other great enjoyments in life alongside Trump class destroyers. In fact, the two often come together. So, CV Passam Parabellum, HMS Edinburgh. She's a nice looking ship. Even in that rather scruffy looking photo, which actually looked very good on my own computer screen, but now on this big screen it's looking less so good. Ah well, life happens. Now, always worth dealing with this because this comes up in my life so often, the myths of the interwar navy. And there are so many of them. Battleship admirals. All the admirals are just obsessed with battleships. They're really not. They're really, really not. They are really looking at a lot of things around the world. The unfortunate thing is for most of this narrative is that battleships do remain quite a big focus because they are still the best ship killing weapon that is available. Aircraft do not really come of age till during World War II and the aircraft carrier aircraft construct as the major form of your battle fleet doesn't come of age until during World War II because of the rate of space of technology. Pace of technology is what makes these things viable. In the 1930s, when you're looking at the aircraft, when you're looking at the ships, it's not a sure thing. It's not a known thing yet because there's a lot of issues with aircraft, with their employment. It's like when we're talking about modern hypersonic weapons and we're going, these are gonna dominate the world. They still need to find a target. You still need to locate the target, you still need to get there. It's all very good, well, having this very long range, very fast artillery. But if you don't have the means to target it, and you don't have the means to properly control it, then it might well not work. And that battleship which you can control, which you can target, which you do have all the abilities to command to use properly, looks very attractive. Fundamentally undermine my treaties. E right, so treaties. They are very useful for the Royal Navy because in a time of restricted budgets, they keep everyone on a evenish playing field. The Royal Navy knows everyone else is cheating them. They're also in the gray area themselves. But the thing is, the usefulness of treaties is that they keep everyone else to roughly within competitive areas and enable the Royal Navy to make the most of what spending it does have. Nothing happened. Um, the Spanish Civil War, the Annus Abyssinian Crisis, whole of China, all sorts of things in Africa, South America, all around the world in the 1920s and 1930s would beg to differ. Lots and lots was going on during the 1920s and 1930s, and the Royal Navy was at the front of most of it, mainly because it was Britain's primary tool for protection of empire. And when you have an empire which spans the globe, you need to protect it. And this is the big defeat for those myths of the battleship admirals. Battleship admirals will be the focus for people who are just obsessed with fighting battles. The Royal Navy was obsessed with maintaining trade with keeping the trade flowing around the world. So this means that when they're looking at things, they're actually obsessed with cruisers, not battleships. Aircraft carriers are being looked at as weapons of fighting battles, but also weapons of fighting trade wars, economic warfare. The battleship admiral's designation doesn't reflect the Royal Navy. If you were making the accusation of them being cruiser admirals, which sounds a lot less 
how do I put this, a lot less World War I, you would probably be incorrect. In the 1920s and 30s, the Royal Navy is cruiser admirals. They are obsessed with their cruiser numbers. They're obsessed with trade protection. They're obsessed with economic warfare. They're obsessed with using this to fight a war against Japan by blockade, or Germany by blockade, or Italy by blockade. Whoever they needed to take on, the Royal Navy's major method of influencing what was going on ashore was blockade. It may work, it may not work, but it was their major, major plan. The battleships were there to fight the enemy if the battle fleet came out. The aircraft carriers were there to protect, uh, direct the cruisers, provide them information, and support the battle fleet. This was a coherent force. The destroyers were there to fight the other destroyers and reinforce the cruisers. There are all sorts of issues going on, but this is not a navy which is stuck in World War I. So, procurement in the 1930s. And this is one of the more fun things. This is the biggest problem for the Royal Navy, and in many ways it's not as true today as it once was, but arguably still true to an extent. The Royal Navy has to go out around the world, it has to by default, so it travels, it sees the world, it becomes familiar. If you have considered senior officers like Henderson, who I was talking about as the third sea lord, Harwood, as the command, Commodore of the South American Division, the Ashworths over in the Far East. All these officers, these families, have spent a long history in the stations they are based in. They know them, they know the people, they have the connections. Henderson has travelled around the world, so when he's deciding and making points about what ships need to be built and how the ships need to be built, he knows what scenarios. He's seen those waters, he's seen those seas. He has an idea what he's building it for. Whereas most of the government ministers haven't had that experience. Most of them have been very much Anglo-centric, if not if maybe Eurocentric. They haven't travelled as widely, they haven't travelled as broadly as these admirals. So when the admirals are trying to advise them on the global impact of the decisions they're making, they are often also trying to have to educate them on what the reality of that world is. The town class are the biggest example of this. The Royal Navy has to be very careful. They can't go making a casus belli. They can't go trumpeting these things as too powerful. They also have to sell them to a home audience. The town class are being built as surface uh, anti-surface raider ships, but therefore that makes them just as good as being surface raiders. And in fact, HMS Liverpool's involvement in the Asimamara incident will make that case painfully clear to anyone looking at it. And so that January is fun. But that means they have a debate, because when you're selling it to a government, you have to sell them on a reason. It's kind of like why the modern town class Type 26, or city class they've been called, frigates are being named as they are, and their names have been released a long way in advance of them actually being ordered. Because cancelling four Type 26 frigates is something a government might do. Cancelling HMS Edinburgh is not something a sensible government is going to do. It's going to piss off all the people in Edinburgh, and therefore the theory is they lose the votes. There is often a theory of you can't gain votes in defence, but you can lose votes in defence by giving your opposition something very e some very easy grounds to make a case for. Them. So you don't cut ships which are named for cities. Now. You also have the problem for the Royal Navy in making the case for itself as a force. Much like today, when you have trendy new techniques like cyber and information warfare coming in, people go, oh yes, these are amazing. These will replace all current forms of warfare. They won't. It's always the dream they will, but they won't. 
The reason they won't is they'll be countless found and they will become part of the arsenal of warfare. They won't go away, but they won't replace. They will still need to be infantry deployed on ground if you need to search houses. Eventually the infantry will have to go in, or a form of infantry. They might be an unmanned robot, but they will be a form of infantry. Eventually, you will, if you want to control sea space, you will need to put a ship there. It might come with a flotilla of unmanned drones to wander around it and protect it and provide different attributes, but there will eventually have to be a ship put there. And if you want to patrol the air, you get it. Space, you've got it. All these things require eventually these things to go there. So, in the 1930s, you have aircraft. And everyone's looking at aircraft and going, how brilliant they would be. And there are actual studies put into how many aircraft equate to a battleship. I seem to remember it's something like 34 medium bombers equate to a battleship in terms of cost. But then they start working out how much firepower does the battleship have versus those bombers and at what range. And then you realise you have to have an airbase for those bombers to launch from, which you have to support and you have to supply logistics to, whereas the battleship takes whatever it is with it, where it's going, and you get into all the complications, and you suddenly realise that in some circumstances, those 34 bombers make perfect sense. In other circumstances, that battleship makes perfect sense. They're not saying they're better than one or the other. They're saying that in circumstances, one is more suitable than the other. This goes for modern aircraft carriers versus land bases too. In certain circumstances, the land base is the best way to go. In others, you want the aircraft carrier. Now, so Global Force in 1939. Again, many of you who've watched another video of mine will have seen me talk about this a lot for a long period. Some of you who haven't, go watch that. But here's the quick precinct. In 1939, the Royal Navy is all over this. The Royal Navy has cruisers everywhere. Even has an aircraft carrier over here. Has aircraft carriers and battleships in here, and aircraft carriers and battleships up here. Also sort of around here. Very quickly, when you have the hunt for the Grass Bay going on and all these things, you have aircraft carriers moving down into this area. And battle cruisers, to be honest. But still, these are mainly in peacetime cruiser stations. In fact, all of these are cruiser stations. Australia and New Zealand are provided by their own naval divisions, navy, and again, are cruiser based forces. Most of the America West Indies command is cruisers. So, why are the battleships close to home? Well, similar reasons as to why aircraft. Stay close to home. Because you need to have infrastructure to support them. Battleships, battle cruisers, aircraft carriers are big, expensive objects. There is a reason the aircraft carriers on the China Station are the smallest carriers the Royal Navy has. There is a reason that of the Henderson's cruiser, the carriers which he's building, HMS Unicorn is the one built for China Station. The forward aviation support ship slash light carrier. The one which has the most workshops on her, so can do the most work herself. Because there is not the infrastructure in this area to support complex warships being deployed there for long times in peacetime. In wartime, you'll pay the expense. In peacetime, you won't. So that's why in peacetime, the battleships, the aircraft carriers are here and here. Here's where all the infrastructure is that supports them. Here there's a bit of infrastructure that can support them, but they can be quickly cycled back to there. And from here, they can quickly get to there, 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 wherever they need to go, basically. So the Royal Navy is a global force. And it's working, it's using forward deployment, which is now currently coming back in vogue, and all sorts of things to maximise that forward presence, to maximise that global interest. And it has to be. Because, think about this again, much of this is a British Empire, much of this is a British Empire, large chunks of this are British Empire. Informal British Empire, 
Formal British Empire, boom. All sorts of things going on that the Royal Navy has to protect for Britain's interests. And then you start to consider her economic interests, and if we consider the early map, the thick lines of trade going around and all ending up here. This is what the Royal Navy had to protect, and this is why, in 1939, it is a global force. Because it has to be. It doesn't have a choice. So let's consider the design of the town glass, and they're pretty. I have no idea why it's doing that, and no idea why I selected this, so I do apologise now. 12 16 guns in four treble turrets. Now, the interesting thing is for Edinburgh and Belfast, they were originally considering turning them into quadruple six inch turrets. So they would have 16 six inch guns. But they found the quadruple turret design so complicated, they reverted back to the trebles. And they maintained that pattern. But they were still longer. They still had more fuel bunkerage. They still had more space. In many ways, they were probably for command oper of operations in a Far East conflict. I, if you're having to blockade Japan and you're deploying flotillas, squadrons of cruisers on these operations, they will need one of those ships will need to carry a pretty significant staff. Belfast and Edinburgh were the perfect ships for this job. Now, they had extensive secondary armaments, they had all sorts of things, but the most important things they had, attributes they had for their role, was large amounts of fuel, giving them a long endurance, good arcs of fire for their gun, including impressive secondary armaments that would enable them to defend against air attack, and Free radar, humongous hangars to take as many aircraft as they could fit. In fact, the theory was they could take two to three fully assembled aircraft, and two to three aircraft would be stowed in boxed form, so they would actually be carrying their own spare aircraft should an aircraft break down. They end up changing from this policy to having two, usually two, sometimes three fully developed aircraft, fully deployed, but carrying a lot of supplies, a lot of maintenance equipment, so they can pretty much rebuild those aircraft if they need to. I.e. they worked out it was far easier to carry replacement engine parts than it was to carry a whole load of wings. But the design starts early. It starts originally as the M class and is part of the 1933 programme. So, why the change from M class to town class? Well, as I said earlier, you need to protect your designs. People are going to try and cut your ships, especially in times of tight finances, in times where people are making governments, politicians of all hues are making different cases for different spending. And remember, at the same time as the Royal Navy is producing a town class, they're also producing a Dido class and the tribal class destroyers. So there are lots of options coming out for what that money could be spent on. Instead, oh, we could be buying Dido, we could be buying Tribals. Well, the Royal Navy was very keen on the Tribals, while Henderson was, and was very keen on the Towns. It was not very clean on the Didos. The Didos he considered to be rather cramped ships. In fact, I think in another talk, I used the expression that the Tribals are cruiser design destroyers with lots of space. The Didos are cruiser, uh, destroyer cruisers in that they are cruiser technically sized, but they are so crammed of stuff, so crammed of equipment and weapons, they're more like a destroyer in terms of their crampness. So they're not really able to do the cruiser roles and not able to fulfill the wider cruiser functions, which is probably a big reason why they end up having far shorter lives than the town class compatriots. Town class are very big cruisers. And they have to be. They are for long-range endurance missions. They are for the traditional cruiser roles of presence, of statemanship, of diplomacy. But also they're for war fighting. They're able to be upgunned, to be upgraded, to be easily organised and fixed when they have problems. 
Space is a useful thing on a warship when it comes to damage control. Space allows you to carry spare parts and space also allows you to retain buoyancy because a smaller part of the ship is flooded, because a smaller part of the ship is damaged percentage-wise. And that means you have space to move the wounded crew away, get in new crew to fix the problem, all sorts of things. So these larger ships are really an advantage from a Navy's perspective. From a Treasury's perspective, which is literally looking at it and going, we can, uh, this, these ships are both called cruisers, so it must be exactly the same. So therefore, this one costs half of this one. While we buy one of this, and we could buy two of this, it becomes a more complicated matter. So the Royal Navy has to make their case. And they do it by calling them town class. And then crown colony class. And then when there's a war going on, then they can get out the end class. It's a big thing. The Royal Navy, thanks to the legacy of World War I, has the surface radar firmly in mind when they're talking about wars and talking about future conflicts. So for them, this capability is critical. It's a problem. Um, I've already alluded to this. The Royal Navy has to make the case for these cruisers, but they have to make it in such a way that they aren't providing a casus belli or a reason for other nations to go massively into their own cruiser arms. The Royal Navy can't afford for other nations to go too over the top with their own cruiser forces because the Royal Navy is so desperate for cruisers to defend all that sea. So they have to both make the case strongly for the town class, whilst also allowing others to make the case against them. It sounds really sort of stupid, but it isn't. You have, on one side, people making the case that this town class are old technology, da 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 da, -da that they are not needed, da 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 da. -da. This makes them look weaker, especially in the eyes of the foreign viewer, perhaps, the uninformed foreign viewer. But the informed foreign viewer and the informed government official and the informed public will also be getting the Royal Navy's case for these ships, for what they'll do. And their case is all based around surface raiders. It's all based around defending of commerce. So it's all about keeping the big city lobbies Let's be honest, the financial institutions and the publics of London, which they had named the county class cruiser for, Liverpool, which gets a town class cruiser, Southampton, which gets a town class cruiser, Glasgow, which gets a town class cruiser, Exeter, which gets a town class, uh, which gets a county class cruiser, a type B one. and all, lots of other places which are critical financial industrial hubs. These are the key groups which the Royal Navy has to make its case to, because they're going to be the ones who are providing the money for the Navy, but also these are the key groups which are going to be affected by economic warfare. So they are the key areas where the Royal Navy can go, look, we're building this cruiser to protect you, to protect your trade. Make the case for us. Yes, 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 we know what other people are saying about fighting battles and fighting this and fighting that, but you know and we know that the biggest risk is commerce raiders. Surface raiders are a huge risk to global trade. These are the ships which you need to defend them. They have aircraft aboard so they can search a wide area to find that surface raider, and then they have more than enough weaponry to engage and destroy that surface raider. That's the case the Royal Navy's making. But the trouble is that the Royal Navy also knows that they might need to go on the offensive, especially in the Far East against Japan. They might need to actually use ships as surface raiders themselves, and the town class will fulfill that brief. 
with those same attributes. Range, firepower, aircraft to do the searching. All of these are attributes for surface raiders. Now, they were used a lot in exercises to test the Royal Navy's counter surface raider policies. And this is just one of those exercises, CDX. Now, in this one, you have three cruisers attacking. The interesting point that happens with this one is you have Glasgow managed to do all this and then there's this. There's a red aircraft barrier shutting up, there's all sorts of different forces going around and yet Glasgow really does make their lives a nightmare. She's the one which causes the most trouble, consistently. Now, Sheffield is the best counter, counter helping. That sort of, she captures Aurora, all sorts of these ships get caught by Sheffield. So she's doing the counter surface radar duties really well. But it's Glasgow which gets through. She uses her aircraft to dodge enemy aircraft and enemy ships. Simple terms, she's pretty much doing exactly what the Graf Spey would be doing in the South Atlantic. She's doing what most of the service raiders the Germans would launch would be using, which had aircraft. Using those aircraft to scout ahead to find the enemy to avoid them. And it works. But, interesting enough, her colleagues, other ships which were doing the same thing, were still caught by Sheffield. So you have the two sides of the same coin. Glasgow and Sheffield, two town-class cruisers, and they are both opposite, uh, on the opposite sides in this one, but both sides, they are the victors. Sheffield doesn't manage to find Glasgow. Which is probably more annoying for Sheffield's crew than anyone else's. But she finds all the other service raiders. Glasgow managed to account for the most targets. But again, the interesting thing here is to look at these maps and look at the aggression which Glasgow is showing. The tenacity which Glasgow is showing in terms of how she's attacking in, of what she's doing to try and take out her opponents. She's behaving far more aggressively than the Graf Spey would. She's behaving far more aggressively than any German surface raider ever would. I'm not saying that those surface raiders were not handled aggressively. They were. They had the proper amount of aggression. But they weren't as aggressive as the Royal Navy were expecting them to be, or as the Royal Navy would be handling them themselves. Yeah. Commissioned on the 6th of July 1939, but she wasn't really ready. She still had trials people aboard, she still had dockyard workers, all sorts of things. In fact, arguably you can't say she's properly ready, properly developed, till at least another month. But then she's commissioned. The reason she's commissioned is because she's important. She has sonar. She has aircraft, she has all sorts of things which make her a very valuable asset. And she gets commissioned straight into the 18th Cruiser Squadron. Now the 18th Cruiser Squadron is a critical unit in that counter-surface radar motif. Their job is to be a barrier to stop the Germans from getting into the North Atlantic, and they do a fairly good job. They're patrolling between the UK and Norway, and the UK and Iceland, 
and they're carrying uh, covering quite a huge area, but they have all these things there to help them. They have their own aircraft and these things. But their other role, apart from risk of patrolling, is to also be the barrier force to, with the destroyers combined and whatever battleships and aircraft carriers happen to be there at the time, to provide this fighting force, which if anything, any especially a task force of German ships, tries to make it into the North Atlantic, to find that task force, engage and knock it out as quickly as possible. They're basically being used as the enforcement crew. And it's terrible weather. Absolutely terrible. Now, she doesn't have to stay up there forever, and she gets down, sent, uh, sent down to the Mediterranean to help with Operation Substance. Now, Substance. Hello. So, when I was looking through the video at the descriptions I gave for Operation Substance and the other convoy that we're going to cover in the Mediterranean. I was a bit disappointed in them, and honestly I'm also a bit disappointed in the convoys for the Arctic, but I'm going to do those in a different way. But, for observation and substance and however, I thought I would try this one. Now, I'm going to be using this book, which hopefully shows up nicely. Now, it's a pretty cool book. And it's one I've made use of a lot of over the years because it really does give a lot of detail. But I will say this I am not that used to using this visualizer equipment in this region and this lecture theatre. So, if it goes a little wrong, you know why. So, Operation Substance was the resupply for Malta. And Edinburgh and Rear Admiral Seyfried, who was in a board, were in command of one of their sections, of Force X, the section which would actually get the convoy to Malta. And the Somerville's Force H was involved, and they would convoy them to the narrows between Sicily and Tunis. And interesting enough, the final group is where Edinburgh links in with the tribal class and all sorts of all sorts of parts of my, uh, my research because she is it's composed of Edinburgh, Man Harima, Hermione, Arethusa, Manxman, Cossack, Maori, Sikh, and three other destroyers, Foxhound, Farndale, and Nestor. Nice time. Now, they have quite an interesting time, and if I get right to Operation Substance, which thankfully, because I have the wearing these pages out so much, I should get to quite easy. And if we can see it here, when I try to photocopy these pages, the bend just made it impossible. So, as you can see in this, the force is coming along on the traditional convoy route, and certainly what will become the traditional convoy route to Malta. It actually makes an interesting passage in that it goes helpfully right where the bend is, north, and then round. Now this is to avoid shallow waters, but also to avoid this area where there's a large concentration of enemy aircraft. It's going to sound interesting, but actually there was in many ways more infrastructure to support enemy aircraft in Northern Africa at this time than there was in Sicily. Sicily does have bases, of course, but Sicily has a very mountainous, very tough terrain. And therefore, it actually makes the supply of airfields and these things in Sicily slightly more difficult. Now, as we can see, there are a litany of air attacks as they get along. Then this area, they managed to get through quite quickly, and then the air attacks again begin. And it's as they pass through the base transitions, but also nights today. Now, substance is interesting because the fact that so much is placed aboard HMS Edinburgh. Edinburgh is so important. Whilst they're cruising like this, that's when they're with Force H. You can see? And all these little arrows are, of course, destroyers. On 
this particular picture, destroyer's armor is important. Why? There's a battleship, a battle cruiser, there's a battleship, there's all these cruisers around. These are the critical ships. Destroyers are just this extra force. You all know I think differently. On this one, the cruising disposition is different. And the names appear on the destroyers because suddenly, without an aircraft carrier, battle cruiser, and battleship around, you're slightly less uh, conscious of their small size. And notice how they're put out. You have Cossack, Edinburgh, Maori on this side. If you think about it, this is the northern side. This is the side towards Italy, where you think you're going to get surface forces attacks come from. And it's exactly what they run up to in that evening. And on this side, you've got Foxhound, Seek, Nestor, Manxman sitting around here. Marifusia and Hermione sitting at the back. That's all it is the case. But you've definitely got a balance of firepower on the northern side to deal with surface threats. And you've got your lovely merchant ships going through here. Interesting enough, there will be torpedo attacks, and the torpedo boats, when they attack, will actually manage to thread through the force, which is a very clever maneuver because it means that these ships can't really fire at full strength because they're worried about hitting each other. They can fire at full strength if you're that way or that way. But if you're a clever torpedo boat captain and you manage to get close enough, and remember, this is really still in the pre-radar period. This is only 1941. There isn't a lot of radar still, uh, still available or still that great. I, radar is around, but it's still in its infancy even in 1941 in terms of its usage, in terms of its reliability, in terms of what they're getting out of it, in terms of the experience of operators. So actually, a torpedo boat managed to get in here. Now, Cossack is shown here. But she takes over the post of Fire Drake. Now, Fire Drake had to withdraw. The reason Fire Drake had to withdraw is she's damaged. So Cossack takes that post. Cossack doesn't have a sweep, but remember what I said about tribal class destroyers, they're good at filling in. So she's filling in. She also provides a forward sort of cruiser presence. Edinburgh, Manxman, you've got your most powerful cruiser next to your cruiser substitute, or actually a, mine, a fast light mine land that's used as a light cruiser. You've then got two tribals. So you've got actually quite a nice front with for a facing force. And if we go back to the map and we look at what they were doing, this is of course the 23rd and 24th of July. And if we again go into this area, this is largely what they are facing on the 24th, on the 23rd. So this is the period, and this is when the most torpedo boats attack. So, so at this point, they're in that cruising configuration, and it's in this point that the cruisers part company and sail straight on. There are also some interesting submarines based around here trying to keep track of what the Italians are doing. And that is an important thing to remember. When we're talking about convoy operators, they're very convoluted, very important things. But there's lots of things being done to manage them, to manage their risk. There are some rings out there. There might be carriers. It's never just the force alone. So, in this boat, Edinburgh is particularly useful because Edinburgh is the key command ship. And she is even critical prior to that point because even though she's adopting, she's the heavy one on the southern side. Nelson, Renown, Arc Royal, they're all on the northern side. And it's quite a spread area. Destroyers are quite widely spread to try and keep submarines out of this box. Operation Substance, of course, ends up with HMS Manchester Damaged. That's one of Edinburgh's elder, slightly smaller sisters, a compatriot of Liverpool and of Birmingham. All the damage, though, is done mainly through air attacks. On the 9th of July, when the pair of torpedo boats do show up, um, 
they manage to attack at high speed, but they they sort of wait to turn on their high speed until they're really quite close, they sort of drift in to force, and they manage to hit the Sydney star. Um, various claims are that they might have sunk one. There is disputes over it. The Royal Navy claims to have, the Italian Navy says they didn't. I think probably the Italian Navy knows what ships they lost. But, I don't know. There are all these negotiations with the troops going on in wartime. And sometimes you lose a ship on, or a unit in one operation and you don't realise it. I'm told. Next, Operation Halberd. Now, Halberd is a sort of similar run to Substance, but it's got an even stronger escort. And this time, the Italian Navy, the surface fleet proper, actually does come out. Um, however, Force X, this time, is commanded by Rear Admiral Burrow from the Crown Colony class cruiser HMS Kenya. Now, this is no critique of Sea Fleet in Star One or Edinburgh. Um, but Kenya is the newest ship, and while she's not quite as powerful as Edinburgh, the thing is, Edinburgh is that much bigger. So, their theory is that if you've got the commander on the slightly smaller ship but still got a lot of space aboard, i.e., she's not that much smaller than a regular town class, then you might be less likely to get attacked by aircraft. That's the hope. The difference between Halberd and Substance is Halberd takes place in September. For a moment. Yes. Why I remember that, this like six time. Right, so Halberd. Contact with the Italian fleet. It's always fun when it happens, but let's have a look at this all. So, as you can see, it's very, very different to substance in terms of the sheer amount of actions going on. The number of submarines involved. And the number of air attacks involved. Consider quickly. This is substance. This is halberd. Far more complicated operation already. There are aircraft involved, striking. There are all sorts of <laughs> different attacks going on. And it gets. Well, the MTBs show up again. But no. So, halberd. However, you have a different time. So if we consider the cruising position. So, again, remember the cruising position from earlier. There's a northern and a southern force. And if we zoom in a bit. Apologies for that. Then you realize that you have quite a complicated force. So you have over here a Polish ship, the IL 62 is. Lance, Gurkha, Duncan, Garland, Lurgley, Haythrop, Fury, Zulu, Cossack, Foresight, Forrester, Lafoy, Farndale, Lightning, and Oregon. You've got a lot of destroyers, but there's also Legion and Pyrrhon down the bottom. Arkroll has two cruiser escorts. Prince of Wales and Rodney are both there. Nelson is there. So you've got three, two battleships and a battlecruiser. Three heavy Catalinas plus a carrier. In the front, you've got Kenya, then Edinburgh, Ajax, not the cruiser, Sheffield. So you've got five cruisers there. 
This is a major force to try and get them through. And it does, to an extent. The Italian fleet comes to sea. And so, one of the forces is sent off to engage them, and this lot continues on. Now this lot, continuing on, looks rather similar to the previous one of substance. You have Edinburgh and Kenya at the front, your two powerful cruisers. Lesson learned from the torpedo attack, you're not relying on a slightly, le uh, slightly less capable vessel on the front, you've got two strong cruisers at the front, hopefully their six inch guns and radar will, deal, will detect the torpedo boats and deal them. But, you have Foresight Forrester, both trailing their sweeps to look for mines. Cossack, Lafore, Zulu, Lightning, Hayfrock, Farndale, and Uribe are down the back, along with Eurylis and Hermione and Sheffield. So you have the five cruisers have continued on, but what you also have is very much a heavy again on the north side. You have Cossack and Zulu sitting on this side. But whilst you have this sort of heavy destroyer element on this side, on you have Lafori and Lightning, two L-class destroyers on this side, who are also quite big ships. What you are looking at here, in many respects, is a far more concentrated force. And I know, it's very confusing having spent the last few weeks talking about the Battle of the Plate to have an Ajax there, which is an HMS Ajax, but she isn't. There you The interesting thing about both these battles, and I do use the phrase battles when I know I'm describing convoys, but there are in many ways ongoing battles, is they are very much air-centric, but they often have worries and fears of a surface fleet action. That is why the Royal Navy sends the heavy escorts it does, because it's worried about surface actions, because it's worried that the Italian fleet will actually get going. When the Italian fleet do get going, then they have problems. The Royal Navy has to react to it. Because the Italian fleet isn't this weak force. Even after Taranto, the, the Italian fleet is still a credible fighting force. They are severely weakened, but they can still mount a credible punch, especially when the Royal Navy has to have assets elsewhere. By 1941, the Royal Navy is having to think about elsewhere. Yes, Prince of Wales shows up there, but she's soon not going to be there. She's soon going to be heading further east. The Royal Navy has to manage a whole world. It's been down in the South Atlantic dealing with the Grass Bay in 1939. It can't ignore the South Atlantic now, so because it's just dealt with the Grass Bay. There are still surface raiders which can go out down there and has to protect the trade. It can't, just because the Italians have entered the war, ignore the Northern Barrier options, operations to prevent the German fleet from getting into the North Atlantic. It especially can't once they seize Norway. So the forces being deployed to the Mediterranean are often the forces they have available. They realise the risks they have, but these are the forces they have available to deploy. And these are the forces which have survived Crete, have survived Dunkirk, have survived Norway, have survived months of operations in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. These are the forces that are being worn down. It's often said you go to war with the force you have. In the case of HMS Edinburgh, the Royal Navy was very lucky. She managed to be gut ready very quickly. But you also go to forces with the war, with, you go to war but you also go to war with the forces you have left. Something important to remember when we're talking about modern payments. 
and procurements and armed forces strengths. We always think about you go to war with the forces you have, and that sounds brilliant to them. But actually, within six months, it's the forces you have left. Because it's going to take you a long time to get new forces online. So you have to start working out a cushion. What is an acceptable level of loss that you can maintain and still operate? Because don't think anything's going to be perfect. And if anyone stands up and tells you that their system is invulnerable and will never be attacked, they are lying. Or they're a fool. Because as defences improve, so do offences. As offences improve, so do defences. This is the way things work. Edinburgh, as a six inch cruiser, a very large six inch cruiser, was actually a very, very useful asset. Thankfully. Now, But Arctic Convoys, I have to say, this is an excellent book and one I really quite like to use, Richard Bourne's. He does a good details. And the interesting things for me, the veterans of Edinburgh here, are PQ6, uh, QP4, PQ14, and QP11. Yay, for the convoys. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have many maps, but it does have some interesting stuff in here which I still want to show you, and I'll be getting it discussing the convoys at another time. The routes. These are the critical areas. The areas which, in many ways, the convoys are dependent upon and decided by. Now, Again, if we consider those Mediterranean convoys, much a similar system is approached when you're putting together the Arctic convoys. And I know this isn't one of the convoys which actually I want to talk about, but it illustrates it quite nicely. Because again, you have the warships on the outside, merchant ships on the inside, and you have cruisers, you have destroyers. You have all the ships you need to organize and protect your force. And it can get really quite massive. PQ-18, that's a very heavily resourced convoy. And it's even got a carrier. HMS Avenger. PQ6 QP4 is are relatively straightforward. They really are. Uh, they are the sort of convoys you would dream of doing later in the war. They're the convoys which would make many people happy to have served on because they have attacks, but they're sporadic, few, and they get through. Their biggest incident is actually picking up minesweepers which have been mistaken by the Germans for being destroyers. 
and they fit in, managed to pick them up once after they've actually had their engagement with the German destroyer. Both groups were out that lay minefields. But it's PQ-14 and QP-11, which are the important ones for us. In PQ-14, HMS Edinburgh goes out. And she's carrying supplies to repair another cruiser which has been damaged in a previous convoy. So she's carrying all these supplies, she's carrying extra personnel. She gets there. She has loads of supplies. But then in QP-11, she's of course on loaded supplies, including a huge amount of gold bullion. And she's heading home. She's heading home at the front of her convoy. And this again seems strange to some people. Why would your cruiser be zigzagging in front of your convoy? Why would it be doing that in front of the convoy? Well, it's doing that to protect its convoy. It's doing that to shepherd its convoy. HMS Edinburgh, and if I go to a big picture of her, HMS Edinburgh is a powerful ship. Zigzagging is the best way to make it difficult for torpedoes to pick you up, but also it's a good way of having a weight going out there of hopefully clearing the area, making sure the water is nice and turbulent. Theoretically this should stop, make it more difficult for attacks on your ships. And it's also quite impressive and keeps the morale of the merchants up. Unfortunately though, zigzags can become predictable. And a submarine, if it's lucky, can get in the right place to cause you a lot of trouble with spread of torpedoes. And this is what happens. Edinburgh gets hit. She doesn't get sunk though. She gets damaged. And she takes people off. When Edinburgh gets damaged at 1607 on the 30th of April, she immediately starts evacuating people, evacuating crew. And the one I'm always interested in is the Czechoslovakian army colonel. You know, how random, the Czechoslovakian army colonel is border in World War II. She doesn't sink though. The great stat I've got there is 64 hours. But let's put that in terms of days. She's done most of three days. Two days, roughly 16 hours. Almost as long as the Grass Bay gets to repair herself in Montevideo after of the Battle of River Plate. She's afloat for 64 hours. She will end up taking four torpedoes in the end. She will end up taking several hundred rounds of four inch of fire of weapons, four inch shells, and depth charges, and no crew aboard actually doing any damage limitation or damage mitigation or any of the, the things they do to try and save a ship for her to sink. And she stays intact. She holds herself together all the way to the bottom. She hits the bottom, she doesn't break up. This is why when they actually go down to find the gold bullion, it's relatively easy to find because the ship is together. Many people presumed that her back would be broken, but it wasn't. And this is a testimony to the toughness of these ships. Look at this. Look at the damage she's taken. Damage and she's sinking. She takes a long time to go down. And she's carrying a very large Roman crew. Uh, the Czechoslovakian army colonel is the one which most interests me. I would love to find out more about him. But her whole purpose in this operation has been to carry the gold, to carry the critical things, because as a cruiser, she's more likely to survive. And she really does show this, because she gets hit by a lot of stuff. Eventually, it's about four torpedoes she's been hit with by the end. 
multiple depth charges. Look at her. This is HMS Edinburgh finally sinking. She's a tough ship and she's not going down easy. But in the end, Rear Admiral Burrow, remember that name, thinks that her back must have been broken. That's the only, and that's why he thinks she sinks. But actually, when we discover her, her back isn't broken. She's fine. She was just too damaged to be able to go home. And they were worried about her falling into the enemy hands because, again, such a useful unit, they didn't want her falling into the enemy hands. Oh. See, I wrote this actually a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm recording it. Edinburgh is fun. She is testimony to the fact that life is always going to be about who turns up, who makes their case, who is visible at the end, who is the decider. She was risked a lot. Again, I seem to be with my love of tribal class destroyers, HMS Unicorn, various things. I seem to like ships which are risked, but warships are built to be risked. Sometimes they survive, sometimes they don't, but that's their purpose in the end. Edinburgh is risked a lot. She never gets to do the peacetime role, so we can't really say how good she'd have been there. We can look at HMS Belfast, and tell you she did very well in peacetime role. She was an excellent peacetime cruiser. Lots of space, lots of ability to be upgraded when time came, lots of abilities to be developed, lots of space, uh, lots of uh, ability to have holster functions and do the diplomacy. So she probably be very good, but we can talk about her wartime experience. Edinburgh fought hard. She really did. The RN, though, was benefiting from having multiple yards in the 1930s and in World War II. It was benefiting from having a competition. We don't have that today. So what lessons can we learn? Well, the Type 31 design is excellent because they've got lots of space on that. Type 26 the design is excellent because it's been supremely designed for anti-submarine warfare. The question we have to ask is what's the Type 14 by successor going to look like? What is any Albion or Bulwark successor going to look like? And will there be successors? My thinking is there should be on those, and I think the lessons from the cruisers is that if you put in space, if you design your ship right, then you get a good ship. We also need to stop ignoring the air, stop thinking that big ship equals bigger expense. It doesn't always. In fact, Bigger ships can actually be easier to maintain, so they can be actually be cheaper to maintain in the long run. They can be easier to upgrade, so it's less likely for you to have to get rid of them and buy new stuff. So bigger ships can be very useful. However, I do realise that some people point out, oh, but if we have small ships, we can have more of them. Well, that's true. And in the 1930s, 1940s, the Royal Navy was looking at the task forces, flotillas. Cruisers, destroyers, sometimes small destroyers, sloops, operating together. But the question is, yes, we need the big ship, probably for the main, uh, for the main fighting force. Yes, we need destroyer and frigate. But why did the sloops, why do those ships have to be manned if we have smaller vessels? Might they have an unmanned buddy going around the world with them? It's something to think about. When I started studying cruisers, like when I studied destroyers, I was thinking about the careers of modern warships. How can the lessons be learned from these ships in the 1920s and 30s help us inform design to this day. HMS Edward never got to be a cruiser in peacetime. She was always a wartime vessel. But her adaptability, her strength, they are good things. Her survivability, 64 hours. 
taking a tremendous amount of damage to actually sink. I'm sure that knowledge is used today in modern warship design. In fact, I know it is. But it needs to always be re-examined and reconsidered what lessons can be learned because the more survivable we make our ships, the better it is for the crew, but also the bigger the risk if we're using them for deterrence. And that's what cruisers were all about in the 1920s and 30s, and that's their legacy. Edinburgh is fun. She is testimony to the fact that life is always going to be about who turns up, who makes their case, who is visible at the end, who is the decider. She was risked a lot. Again, I seem to be with my love of tribal class destroyers, HMS Unicorn, various things. I seem to like ships which are risked, but warships are built to be risked. Sometimes they survive, sometimes they don't, but that's their purpose in the end. Edinburgh is risked a lot. She never gets to do the peacetime role, so we can't really say how good she'd have been there. We can look at HMS Belfast and tell you she did very well in peacetime role. She was an excellent peacetime cruiser. Lots of space, lots of ability to be upgraded when time came, lots of abilities to be developed, lots of space, uh, lots of uh, ability to have holster functions and do the diplomacy. So she probably be very good, but we can talk about her wartime experience. Edinburgh fought hard. She really did. The RN though was benefiting from having multiple yards in the 1930s and in World War II. It was benefiting from having a competition. We don't have that today. So what lessons can we learn? Well, the Type 31 design is excellent because they've got lots of space on there. Type 26 the design is excellent because it's been supremely designed for anti-submarine warfare. The question we have to ask is what's the Type 14 5 successor going to look like? What is any Albion or Bulwark successor going to look like? And will there be successors? My thinking is there should be on those. And I think the lessons from the cruisers is that if you put in space, if you design your ship right, then you get a good ship. We also need to stop ignoring the air, stop thinking that big ship equals bigger expense. It doesn't always. In fact, Bigger ships can actually be easier to maintain, so they can be actually be cheaper to maintain in the long run. They can be easier to upgrade, so it's less likely if you have to get rid of them and buy new stuff. So bigger ships can be very useful. However, I do realise that some people point out, oh, but if we have small ships, we can have more of them. Well, that's true. And in the 1930s, 1940s, the Royal Navy was looking at the task forces, flotillas. Cruisers, destroyers, sometimes small destroyers, sloops, operating together. But the question is, yes, we need the big ship, probably for the main, uh, for the main fighting force. Yes, we need destroyer and frigate. But why did the sloops, why do those ships have to be manned if we have smaller vessels? Might they have an unmanned buddy going around the world with them? It's something to think about. So what's the legacy of the town class? Strength. Strength and size. HMS Edinburgh herself though is a legend for her gold and the amount of the sheer amount of effort they went to to recover that gold. By yum did they do a lot of that work. But she took a long time to sink and she held most of that gold together, which is a feat in and of itself. Yeah, and that gurning person is me. Do apologise for the sports advert going on. Anyway, hope you're having a good day. Hope your Christmas has been great and happy Boxing Day. Take care and catch you.
Now, when we're talking about a town class cruiser, when we're talking about HMS Edinburgh, they are vehicles of conventional deterrence. They were out in the Far East, they were out around the world deterring conflict. Which meant they had to sometimes take risks, which meant they had to possibly let the other guy get the first shot in, which means they needed to be very survivable. And building a light cruiser survivable seems strange, it seems impossible. Why not build heavy cruisers? You have more weight, you can do more of them. No, you can actually make a light cruiser more survivable and you can make it stronger. Because you can stow more shells, more firepower for the six inch guns, which I've been over in the past. But also, and this is the really critical part, you can actually use the space a six inch cruiser on a large hull provides to increase its survivability to make sure there is proper waterproofing, proper division, proper organization below decks. And that's the critical thing. On Belfast, on our sister Edinburgh, which we've been discussing, and all the other town class cruisers, it's the division of the low decks. It's the rabbit warren that is in the hull that is what's critical to their survival. And critical to them being useful. Vice Admiral Bottom and Carter. Fortune had broken back. As I said, Admiral Burrow, when he was discussing it later in the war, Fortune must have had her back broken. That was what they presumed would have sunk Edinburgh because of the sheer weight of firepower. It isn't. Well, actually, sunk her is just eventually too much water got in, and there's no damage control, nothing going on to prevent that water getting everywhere. Four hundred thirty-one bars of gold. Anyway, so what's the legacy of the town class? Strength, strength and size. HMS Edinburgh herself, though, is a legend for her gold and the amount of the sheer amount of effort they went to to recover that gold. By yum, did they do a lot of that work? But she took a long time to sink, and she held most of that gold together, which is a feat in and of itself. Yeah, and that gurning person is me. Do apologise for the sports advert going on. Anyway, hope you're having a good day. Hope your Christmas has been great, and happy Boxing Day. Take care, and chat soon.